and welcome to Thrift Shop Biography. This is the one about Fred Astaire. Thank you for listening. Hello. Hello. And um, what book did you find us this week on your thrift shop travels? Fred Astaire. Fred Astaire. Steps in time. Steps in time. The autobiography of the greatest dancer who ever lived. Yeah, I have to say, I was beside myself with happiness to find this book because he's an amazing hero of mine. I used to watch all those old films. Did you? And my granddad always watched Fred Astaire films and used to tap dance. Do you have a tap dancing granddad? Yeah, and he was a big fan of Fred Astaire. By the end of the book, I felt really emotional. I phoned my mum. Loved Fred Astaire, and he saw all the films as they came out. Oh, just, wow. Anyway, do you like Fred well, Astaire? Well, I, I know who he is, obviously. He's a cinematic icon. I know that he's a fantastic dancer. I'm not really that interested in him. I've got to be <laughs> honest, when you came and presented this book to me, I was a bit like, oh, OK, got to read about Fred Astaire <laughs> now, have we? But do you know what? That's the whole point of doing this podcast. We're reading stuff that we're finding and not stuff that we would choose. I would have so totally I, chosen this, obviously. I totally wouldn't have yeah, chosen it. Yeah, it's great, yeah. that. yeah. And you loved it? (laughs) I absolutely loved it. Did you? Yeah, I did. Me too. Yeah, I'm so fascinated by the whole thing. So should we just get straight into it? Because we haven't talked about it. That's another thing with this podcast. We never, ever talk about this book until we press record. Yes. I'm pressing record. You already have, haven't you? I hope. (laughs) Oh, can I just firstly say, what a nice man. Really nice man. What a lovely, lovely person. Yeah. Okay, he was born in 1899. It's yes. a long time ago. It's two centuries ago now. Two? Just, well, it's in the 1800s. Yeah, it is. Just yeah. scraped yeah. in. Yeah, and his sister was born three years earlier. So did you know anything about Adele? No, I knew nothing. Did, I, did you know she existed? I don't think I did, no. That I, was I a big revelation yeah. to me with this book. I didn't know he had an older sister who was the leading lady and he was second yeah. to her. She was the dancer. She was the star, yeah. and he. I mean, they became a child couple, but she was always the one who had the most attention. Because obviously it's before things were being filmed and stuff. Yeah. I'd love to see them dancing I know. together. It's just I'd, not there, I'd is it? I'd love to watch some of these old shows. I Googled them. You can't even see pictures of the staging. Yeah. I really would like to have seen the staging. You see still photos of them, but that's all. By all accounts, if you're reading the reviews and the reports, she's a better dancer than yes. Fred there. Yeah, definitely. Wow. Yeah. So, oh my God, his early life is so brief because... They go off to become child stars so early. Yeah. But they were from Omaha. In Nebraska. Yeah, he grew up there, well, from noughts to four and a half before they moved. But his dad was from Vienna. He was in the army and he failed to salute his older brother. Oh, yeah. Who was his superior. So that his older brother threw him in the guardhouse. So as soon as he got out, he was like, I'm off. I'm done with this. Mm-hmm. And moved to... New York and then on to Omaha where he worked in a brewer's because that was his family history. Married his mother in 1896. Married his mother? No, he married Fred Astaire's mother. <laughs> oh, my God. I hear it's a bit like that in Omaha. <laughs> the mother is a legend. The mother lives on. The mother's still alive when he wrote this book. Wow. And she's very beautiful and a real character. Mm-hmm. They both sound lovely, his parents, actually. Yeah. Not least because they recognised the talents of Adele in particular very early on and just Mm. really pushed to make her a massive... Well, to get her career in dancing. She was really into ballet and Fred used to tag along sometimes. I wonder that. Was she really talented or was it one of those where they just say, let's make some money out of our kids? Well, do you know what? As I was reading this, it's such a massive undertaking because they weren't a starry no, family. They were just regular people whose daughter could dance a bit, right? Yeah, mind you, his dad played the piano and yeah, loved the theatre. Yeah. So that's, that's all. They just took that massive leap of faith because it's not long before the mum is on the train with young mm-hmm. Adele and yeah. Fred yeah. going to New York in the hope of making Adele a star. That's true, and she was stage struck. It says she was stage struck. So, yeah, maybe it is supporting her. How much older is Adele than Fred? Three Three years. years. Yeah, so she was seven. So she's seven. seven. Yeah. I mean, who completely changes their life in the hope that your seven-year-old daughter is going to get... I'll tell you who, parents of successful people. Yeah, do you know what? You see, I I know who else did this. Who? Britney Spears. I was thinking that. Yeah, And it it blew my mind, because Britney Spears is real humble beginnings, right? Oh, yeah. So why on earth did Britney Spears' mum and dad, well, you know, we know more about him now, 
Why did they go to New York in the hope of making their seven-year-old daughter a massive star? I mean, who would ever think that would happen? Well, I've seen videos of her singing. She's amazing, even at seven. I know, but lots of kids are amazing yeah. singers. Loads of parents will take them to New York and only a few of them will get anywhere. Oh, so you're saying... One in hundreds. L- so lots of people, of people do this, do it, but yeah. we only hear about the Britneys yes. and the Fred Astaire's. I would definitely say that's okay. the case. Oh, my God. So there's a heap of lots of <laughs> disappointed kids. families. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's quite sad. <laughs> Anyway, so... It is a success story. It is a success a story. A big one. Yeah. Oh, it's so great. So, yeah, they take them to New York. He's four and a half in 1904. They found an advert for the dancing school in the back of a trade paper, a sort of showbiz trade paper. Claude Alvien's dancing school, which was in the Grand Opera House in the middle of New York. And that's all they had, this advert. Wow. And a talented seven-year-old and a boy tagging along. Yeah. So they put him in the same school just out of convenience, really. He says, there's a quote early on in the book where he says, dancing was merely something my sister did. Yeah. So he had no aspirations himself. But he was just being dragged along because he was taken to New York with his Mm. sister. He got involved in the lessons eventually. Crazy, eh? So they did a year there and... After that year, they had an act through the school. It was a bride and groom act on a cake. On There's a, a picture ma- in the book. And they had this cake made. The mum paid for it. The steps lit up. It's yeah. actually, yeah, I mean, bit. steps lit up on a cake. They'd have had to plug that in. That's actually quite high tech for a child act. I did think that because it cost a lot of money. And I just kind of thought, wow, why would you spend that much money? Oh, because if it's successful, you'll tour it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And it was. And they got on the circuit and they were a successful child act almost immediately. The local paper said the Astaire's are the greatest act in vaudeville. They were on with dogs, acrobats, monologists and illusionists and ventriloquists. What's a monologist? I imagine it's someone who just talks. <laughs> <laughs> just what, like a monologue? Yeah. A monologist? Yes, I did think that too. I imagined that somebody just stands there and uh, oh, okay, just does comes a speech. Out. Yeah, no, well, they'll come out and do a Shakespeare sonnet or something. Yeah, something like that. But it's, it's funny, I'd never heard that as a thing. I'm yeah. a monologist. Monologist. We're duologists right now. <laughs> duologists. Because <laughs> <laughs> it's a wedding cake and they play the part of a bride and groom, Fred Astaire wears a top hat. Yes. And he actually says... There it was. The evil idea was planted way back then. I've been trying for years to dispel the fact that I was born in a top hat, but I guess I came close to it. Yeah, it's true. So the very first thing he did at four and a half yeah. was wearing a top hat. And the hat. reason they put him in a top hat is because he was so much smaller than his sister. Yeah. Tried to elevate him so they looked like they could be a bride and groom together. <laughs> But they tour the Orpheum circuit. You know the Orpheum Mm theatres. There's still some of them in America, aren't they? But these absolutely beautiful signs outside. Mm -hmm. They did 20 weeks at $150 a week with the train fares paid and their mother paid to go along with them. Yeah. That's a good deal in 1904. Yeah, for sure. By the way, that all came about. They're obviously great. It's due to his father's salesmanship. And it really sounds like his dad is incredibly sociable. He makes people like him immediately. As their career grows, his dad is seeking out the people that can be really useful to them and really ingratiating himself with them. The early stages, he says, are down to his dad. Because his dad would visit New York. His dad didn't move to New York, but he'd be going backwards and forwards and seeing them. It's not just the talent of Adele at this point. It is actually a family team thing, isn't it? Yeah, and he's supporting them financially from still working in Omaha. It's amazing because that's that's quite a way. It's Mm -hmm. quite a trip. Anyway, it says they were seasoned vaudevillians at seven and nine years old, but they started to outgrow their material. And she started to outgrow him. She's kind of towering over him at this point. And the top hat just gets bigger and bigger. (laughs) But the early reviews, they are very successful. But the early reviews favour Adele Absolutely. over Fred. Not just the early ones, for like yeah, a good right. ten years or yeah. more. Mm-hmm. So then they have to take two years off and they go to school. So they have a normal childhood for a couple of years. But there was talk of them going back to Omaha. But the kids loved New York so much that they just were like, oh, please let us stay in New York. So they stayed in New York. Mm. And they were just normal kids for a couple of years waiting for Fred to catch up <laughs> yeah. with Adele in, yeah. in height. And then they signed up to Ned Wayburn's dancing school and the director of that was also a director on Broadway, so he's really well connected, and wrote them an act which Mother paid $1,000 for. 
It's a lot of money. It's a lot of money, but they must have saved quite a lot from earning that, yeah. that money on the in the touring years. Yeah. But it wasn't even that good, the act, from all accounts, because it flopped. But it's really interesting because it's this whole description of the vaudeville era where you get on a bill of, like, eight acts, and if you're on first, people are still coming in, yeah. getting seated, the usherettes are talking to them, everyone's talking to each other, no-one's paying any attention to you. Of course it flops, because anyone who is paying attention is so distracted. And also, their act wasn't entirely music and dancing they'd have a little bit of dialogue at the yeah. beginning and of course if Not nobody sat hear. listening to that yeah yeah so it flops it says they played every rat trap and chicken coop in the midwest for about two years so that, that was their life for a while absolutely not being really successful hey and this is something i think is absolutely amazing you know how all these books we read where people just get burned out they always take the summer off and have yes. really nice holidays and their mum and dad clearly save enough money to pay for nice hotels. Mm-hmm. And they vary it between seaside resorts and mountain resorts. Like half the summer at the seaside, half in the mountain. That's their whole summer. They take every summer off for most of but his life. Presumably that's because vaudeville is seasonal. Yeah, it does continuously say that nobody goes to the theatre in the summers because it's too hot and they don't have air conditioning. Right. No one wants to go in. Yeah. It's, it's really sane. This is the sanest life story I've Actually, ever read. Actually, you're right. Yes, yeah. you're absolutely right. They're, they're never overworked. Yeah. They have a really nice work-life balance yeah, before that do. was even a phrase. They do. So they just doing lots of little gigs here and there. So they went on the circuit for a mm. bit. They have a, an agent at this point, but he's small time and he's getting them all these little shows. Mm. And then there's a strike, which means, again, they can't work. Also, at this point, as I was reading the book, I kept thinking the image of them being actual children yeah. was in my head. But actually, at this point, they're young teenagers now, right? So we're talking like 1912, 1914. So Fred is 12, 13. And Adele's like about 16 at this point. They don't have the cutesy appeal of being those little kids anymore. You know, they are becoming young adults. Fred is now the same height as Adele. So they can't rest on the fact that they're this cute novel thing. They have to dance. Yeah, they they're at an awkward brilliant. in between age, aren't they? Yeah. There's a big change comes when his dad finds these vaudeville legends called Aurelia Cochia. Yeah, and that's wife. exactly how you say it. Is it? <laughs> Anyway, they're vaudeville legends and they gave them lessons in tango, the waltz and showmanship. Mm -hmm. And it really elevated them. Mm -hmm. It was a really big step up. Gave them new songs, new dance routines. And that got them on the Texas circuit. And it got them a bigger agent, Max Hayes. Yes. And they were on $175 a week at that point. And then they got on the Orpheum circuit with this new act, $225 a week. Mm -hmm. Then they were off. But they're still at the bottom of the... They were still at the bottom on the first on the bill. But then by complete chance, they were on a week off. This act in Chicago got ill. And so they got a phone call. Can you come and fill in for a week? And it was like the middle of the bill, wasn't it? It was the middle of the bill. And every single time they danced, they stopped the show. Yeah. So showstopper literally came from the fact that in vaudeville, where there would be eight things on the bill, if one of those acts was incredibly successful, where they just got repeated standing ovations, so you can be fourth on the bill, not the headliner, but if you blow the audience away, the audience will keep asking you back for encores and stuff, so you stop the show. And that's exactly what... Adele and Fred Astaire did in Chicago. The whole week, it's every amazing. single time they yeah. did it, they stopped the show. And it's the, the same act that wasn't hitting because of the position on the yes, bill. Yes, exactly. There yeah. you go. Yeah. It's really cool, isn't it? Yeah. And um, the headliners on that tour were Eduardo and Elisa Cancino. Their act was Spanish dancing. They had a daughter called Rita Cancino, who became Rita Hayworth. Yeah, amazing. Who he huh? later was partnering well, with Well, I learned films. stuff about her in this book because I didn't know she came through as a dancer. Exactly. I learned on the vaudeville circuit. Yeah. So by the time of 1916, yeah. they are legitimate big stars of vaudeville, yes, right? Yes. But Adele is still getting the better of you. Oh, yeah. They're kind of like Adele is far superior to her brother. Yeah. It's kind of good. <laughs> I guess in dancing, especially if it's traditional waltzes and tangos, the man is more the person who stays still and whips the girl mm. around, so the girl's got more of a chance to shine. 
But they had an act as well, didn't they? It was always dancing and then some jokes and some. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, definitely. It wasn't skit just yeah. They that. were really good at the comedy and yeah. the sparkle and the humour. Yeah, yeah. They had more than your average dance act. Yes, which is why they were stopping the show, right? Yeah. In yeah. 1916, Fred Astaire. This is genius. He took out a full page advert in the back of Variety with all their amazing reviews. And the next week, they got a contract for a Schubert musical show, and that was the end of their vaudeville career and the beginning of their career in actual musicals. What a piece of enterprising genius. And they never went back to They vaudeville. never went back, but yeah. he made that happen. Yeah. Him, not his agent, him. Brilliant move. And do you know, one of those reviews said, and I think this nails Fred Astaire, Fred has eccentric agility and humour... Because when you watch him dance, he is more than a dancer. I'm very new to this. And obviously, I've been on YouTube to watch him dancing. Oh, he really is in a class of his own. Absolutely. And it's not just about the dance steps. It's everything he embodies. And there is such a personality there when he's dancing. Yeah, and although he's always he always works with the choreographer... Later on, it's Hermes, Pan in the films and certain other people, Bob Alton, some legends of choreography. He is always creating his own dances as well. He doesn't always credit himself for his own choreography. He does invent the story. So he's storytelling through dance. He's not welded to any particular style, ballet, anything. He's interpreting stories and creating dance moves around them. That's to do with the vaudeville act, I suppose, putting on a show, just telling yeah. a story, entertaining people. It's amazing, isn't it? They always say how light on his feet he is. It's like he's flying through the air. And of course, he's working his ass off, but it doesn't come across. I know we haven't got to Ginger Rogers yet. I watched a video of the pair of them dancing together. It's almost otherworldly. It's just like they're not touching the floor. And the way they do that thing when they speed up and slow down and stuff, it's just like, is this camera trickery? No, it's not. It's them. He's amazing. But also, if you look at her who's also amazing, her face, it's just like she's not even trying. It's incredible. It's effortless. Yeah. They they just make it look... I don't, I, I'm almost beyond words for it. And so I'm it's glad... It's incredible, isn't it? I, my initial resistance to this book, where I kind of was a bit like, oh, my <laughs> God, Fred Astaire, I now am so grateful that you found it. Because oh, it's just opened up this whole new world. And I appreciate dance in a oh, different way. Oh, my God, it is. Yeah, because you get the idea in this of how hard they, they work without him banging on about it. But just... Oh, yeah, yeah, it's amazing, isn't it? Yeah. It's just... It's, it's nuts. And his worries, it's like he's such a nice man. All of his worries and anxiety goes into the <laughs> work. I love his worries. I love his anxiety. Yeah. Uh, but I love how much Adele winds him up. Yeah, he calls him Moaning Mini. Moaning Mini. <laughs> it's like he's always finds something to moan about or something to worry about. But that's because he's a perfectionist yeah. in his work. Which is, like Adele is a different beast, really, because hmm. she doesn't worry. And, in fact, Adele doesn't even really rehearse Yeah, he's always much. like, let's go into the theatre and rehearse that number because we can improve it. And she's like, I don't want to rehearse. Fred Astaire always gets her early, like, yeah. to her. He loves the empty theatre before anybody else gets her. Adele is not interested in going <laughs> in. But that kind of says to me, oh, she is like a child genius of dance. She was born yes. dancing, which is obviously why her mum and her dad spotted that. It just came so naturally to her. She's so confident with it that she doesn't even need to rehearse before a show, whereas Fred really has to work. He has to work, but also he's creating and he wants to make it better and he Mm -hmm. wants to improve. If we add this bit or let's add that Gershwin song, that will sort this out. Mm -hmm. Or He's always sorting it out. But look, he's the one who went on to become a household name and she retired to get married and have try and have kids. It's amazing that Fred Astaire is one of the most famous names of the 20th century. Mm. And Adele Astaire, nobody knows who she is. Yeah, because she did her job and then packed it in. He, It's the film, so he's imprinted forever. You can always access him. And I think it's partly the radio shows he did. You enter into people's homes. Yeah. If people didn't go to the cinema, they all had a radio. He did a couple of years where he was doing one radio show a week, and I think that's how you reach everybody. It's that thing that Cher said. She was a pop star with number ones in England and America, so she was famous. Mm. But she said when they got the Sonny and Cher TV show, when they were in people's homes, she couldn't walk down the street without all the old ladies saying, that's true fame. So you're right, Adele was around when they were famous in a certain area, but then Fred kept going 
and was on the radio. Yeah. He was getting into people's homes. Yeah. Yeah, she she's as absolute legend of the theatre. Yeah. And yeah, not the wider public. Yeah. So they've left vaudeville behind and they're getting into musicals. The first thing they did was called The Passing Show of 1918. World War One was raging at that time, obviously, and he was drafted just as the war ended, so he didn't have to go, yeah. which was a bloody lucky thing. And they advertised that show as 150 people, two acts, 25 scenes, and it was on at the Winter Gardens. That's an extravaganza. Mm. One thing I didn't realise is this isn't a vehicle for Fred and Adele. No, they're, they're just an act in They're it. an act in it, and there are other dancing acts within yeah. it. So they're one of a few. It's not like they're all of a sudden catapulted to being the stars in all. the spotlight. There's yeah. a few other people within these shows, mm. yeah. But, yeah, in 1919, they have a summer run in Chicago with Apple Blossom. At this point, they're on 550 Dollars a week. Note, as soon as he goes to start doing films, he never mentions his salary. <laughs> I imagine it's tons. Yeah. He says at some point, one film he made flops. He says, it doesn't matter because I made a fortune. Wow. He uses the word fortune. He says that's why films is better than theatre because you still get paid. <laughs> And George Gershwin was the rehearsal pianist for that show, <laughs> just as a favour. <laughs> it just kind of blows my mind. <laughs> yeah, and then they do the love letter in 1920. And at this point, they have a choreographer called Teddy Royce who invented the runaround. Oh, I tried to find this on YouTube. You can't find it because it was just in the theatre. Oh, damn it. It never made it to the film. But it's brilliant. He said this is going to bring the house down, right? Adele comes on and runs, like, sort of trots around the stage, that does a couple of circles of the stage, and then Fred will join her and they sort of trot around in about three more circles together in unison and then trot off. And he says, trust me, it's going to bring the house down. And it, it did. did. That's why I wanted to watch it so yeah, badly. Sounds, but yeah. I've got it in my mind. But it just sounds so it sounds basic. It hilarious. Do you I think that's was, part of the fun? I guess it's that just hilarious. That they're these amazing, yeah. able dancers that do these intricate steps and then all of a sudden the showstopper is them just trotting, trotting around, around in circles. circles. Yeah, that's trot, funny. In unison. Yeah, that is funny. It's Yeah, it is, isn't it? And they, <laughs> it's such a showstopper that they keep it for the next yeah. 10 years yeah. and just put it in all of their shows for 10 years. <laughs> So the love letter wasn't a big success. In fact, it was the first time they kind of flopped. But what actually happened is that Noel Coward was in America and he came to see them backstage and he says, you have to come to London. And they'd not really thought about it before. Yeah. So he planted the seed. I don't think they went for a couple of years. No, they didn't. But also he went to have a suit fitted and the bloke who was fitting his suit was called Alex A. Aarons. Says to him, Oh, I've seen your shows. You you know, you really should come to London. And he's like, why are you the suit fitter talking to me about shows? And he says, oh, my dad's a big Broadway producer and I intend to go into it. Within a year, I think, he's phoned them up and said, come to London, I'm producing a show in London. Isn't that nuts? Yeah. Having a suit fitted. <laughs> so there's another reason they go to mm -hmm. London. You know, they did this show called The Bunch and Judy, which was a massive hit. And they have this routine where they actually dance on a table. A banquet table. Which the other dancers are lifting up above their heads. Yeah. I mean, never used to have insurance for stars no. in those days. I think there's about 12 people lifting it. And he says, he keeps saying this is too dangerous because it absolutely relies on everybody lifting yeah. it together. And they don't always. And they get tipped off the table yeah, all they, the time. As they keep falling yeah. off. But they're not only having to be on the table, they're having to dance as well. Yeah, they don't fall off, they get tipped off by the <laughs> incompetent people Do you lifting you know what, it. I bet that is funny to watch it. Jeez. But the worst thing is, I bet the audience think that's part they of the act. They great things. <laughs> <laughs> they're the stars of that show. They're yeah. actually finally the stars of that show. Mm -hmm. So should we get them to London? Are you there? Yeah, let's get them to London. Let's get them to London. It's 1922... And Fred is 22, uh, so Adele is around 25, 26. And they go to London for the first time to yeah, do their show. They love it. The show is called For Goodness Sakes. Yeah. By the way, on that big voyage to London, it's their first big ship voyage. It's a thing because it's like a two-week journey. They get asked to dance on the oh, ship. Yeah. And that's where the ship's rocking back and forth so much and they're really slidey floors. <laughs> that they end up just sliding around and falling over and everything's rocking around and it brings the house down because his sister's such a wag. Yeah. <laughs> she makes a big comedy out of it. She's really in her element doing that. He puts it years later into the film The Royal Wedding, which I watched and there it is. And one of the 
a ship's butlers or whatever tells him that once a whole chaise long with people on it slid right across the <laughs> dance floor. And that's in Royal Wedding. Is it? Well, it's like the end of their dance, this chaise long rolls forward and they fall onto it and that's the end of it. <laughs> and it makes you realise how much of his ideas are in these films. They're in the films. There's that whole yeah. journey and all their experience in London. The words, he says, are in that script in mm-hmm. the film The Royal Wedding. And get this, it's 1923, they stay at the Savoy Hotel and he said it was furnished in a rather exotic modern style. <laughs> I was going, modern? It's Art Deco. Oh, my God. Yeah, right. That was modern then. Oh, my God. It's, that's blown my mind. <laughs> <laughs> so their show, for goodness sake, they open it in Liverpool mm. and it's a big hit. They mm. take it to Edinburgh and then they come back to London in the Shaftesbury Theatre. Yeah. Oh, do you know what? I do think, just talking in terms of, like, London theatres, when you sit there before the show starts, I do think, oh, my God, all these amazing people have played on this yes. stage. Yeah, it's mind-blowing that. when you sit there and imagine them all there. Because the interiors of the theatres pretty much look the same as they, they did 100 they years do. ago. They uh, gems, aren't they? Yeah. They're, they're little mini palaces, really. But I never actually imagined that stage could have had Fred Astaire on it. I yeah. know. Because I don't think of him as a theatre person. I think of him as a film Me person. too, and also he's American. I didn't know he had all this career in London. They were big stars of the London yeah. stage in well, the 20s. Well, this show, their first show at the Shaftesbury Theatre was a massive hit. Yes. And everyone came to see them, yeah. even royalty Prince Charles. Oh, I was trying to figure out who is Prince Charles a hundred years oh, ago. It's not. It's the Prince of Wales, not Prince Charles. Okay, so I read Prince of Wales in the book, and in my head I translated yes. it to Prince Charles. I was thinking, who was Prince Charles? Oh, I'm really years glad ago? because I was thinking, <laughs> I don't know who these royals are. Yeah, no, I, I don't, don't know who they, know they are. are. And then I worked it out because the Duke and Duchess of York. Yes. At one point, they say, "Come to the palace and meet." See the uh, baby. The baby, and it's. Queen Elizabeth II. Yes. Our queen. I know yeah. she's not anymore, but she always will she be. She is. She, she will always, always will be. be the queen. She's the queen. So they're in England, in London, for months. Yeah. So when they go back to New York, they carry their massive London success with them. Yeah, and of course, the New York society were going, oh, you're in with all the royals. Yeah. Tell us about that. So that elevated their status loads. And they now get, they can command like $2,000 a yeah. week in New York. So they're properly, yeah, they they've are. made it, haven't they? Oh, by the way, when they're in Britain, he says, you look out in the audience, there's a sea of white ties, bejeweled ladies and the occasional diamond tiaras. <laughs> Imagine now, people just go in their jeans. Oh, I know. It's just a whole different level. I blame Mamma Mia. <laughs> it's deteriorated <laughs> theatre and theatre audiences. Yeah, but before that, there was cats. So there was a lot of going backwards and forwards between yeah. New York and London, yeah. right? They're back in London at the old Empire Theatre in Leicester Square. Right when they were doing their show, which was 1927, the Empire got sold to be turned into a cinema. The Empire right. Cinema in Leicester Square, which I've right. been to. I went to the premiere of the James Bond film, Skyfall, in the Empire Cinema. And it is massive. The whole place is cavernous. And it just blows my mind that the last time it was ever a theatre, which never occurred to me, was Fred Astaire. They closed that theatre. Everyone wanted a ticket to the closing night. And the royals were all phoning him personally saying, please, can you get us a ticket? Oh, they had to bump somebody out of a box. Yeah, and that's so when they had that massive party afterwards. So they get back to New York, biggest people ever in theatre, and they do a show called Funny Face, which is another... Well, actually, the rehearsal wasn't great, right? No, it's terrible. This is what he says. I hate flops and this is one. This damn turkey hasn't got a chance. I'm sick of this racket anyway. (laughs) (laughs) Massive hit. Massive hit. And then actually films are really becoming a thing now like Mm. the talkies and stuff and paramount wanted to make a film of funny face because it was such a big hit but they screen tested fred and adele astaire and decided that it wasn't going to happen yeah wow and then years later of course it's made into a film with uh what's her lovely face audrey hepburn with fred astaire with fred astaire oh it's lovely so Funny Face then goes to London, which is a massive again. And oh, on the closing night was when Adele first met a gentleman called Lord Charles Cavendish. Yeah. And she'd had so many suitors before. It sounds oh. like she's just going out with everybody. She was beating them off with a stick. Yeah, but she's really good at dealing with them, yeah. keeping them at bay. Anyway, so they did a Ziegfeld show called Smiles. With Marilyn Miller, which actually was... 
a shattering disappointment. Yes. So that's the reverse of Funny Face, which they thought was terrible, yes. which became a massive hit. Yeah. With Smiles, with Marilyn Miller, who was a big star, they were excited. This was a huge project, and it just tanked. It was a disaster. Yeah. So even though they're massively famous, they are not always getting massive hits. Yeah, they're not. And around this time, they did a show called Bandwagon, which later got made into this amazing film which has that dance in it that basically Smooth Criminal was inspired by, Michael Jackson. He comes in with his fedora hat and he's shooting all these baddies and knocking them all out. It's exactly Smooth Criminal. So hang on, we've read a Michael Jackson book. Yeah. He cites Fred Astaire as like one of his heroes. His yeah, it's, his dan- right? it's one of his two dance heroes. He spent forever just in his room watching Fred Astaire films and watching him dance and copying his dance. Because you're a massive Michael Jackson fan. Mm. Can you see Fred Astaire in Michael Jackson? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Okay. Loads of his... It's a bit Bob Fussy, a bit Fred Astaire and a bit his own. That's amazing then, that Fred Astaire's dancing carried on through the years Mm. and is now being shown to a whole new audience by the biggest pop star on the planet. Mm. So it's trans it transcends genres. So Michael Jackson is like a super fan. He's a super fan, yeah. Yeah, Acknowledged, yeah. He does acknowledge it. Great. About this time, Fred Astaire gets a phone call. There's another couple of dancers in a musical called Girl Crazy. Oh yeah. And they're having a really hard time cracking a routine. They just can't do it. So the producer who knows Fred Astaire calls him and says, Can you come over and work some of your Astaire magic? So he goes over to help them, and the lady in that coupling turned out to be Ginger Rogers. Ginger Rogers. It's the first they, time they yeah. met. Yeah, and they became mates. They went out on the town dancing a lot mm-hmm. as friends. She's so cool. So by the time they get cast in a film together, it's like, oh my old mate. Yeah. <laughs> and that musical Girl Crazy was the thing that shocked Ginger Rogers to mm-hmm. stardom. That was a massive hit. And then she went to the film industry first. She was there a year yeah. before Fred got there. Yeah, she was already kind yeah. of a star yeah. by the time he got there. So this is like 1931. Two things happen here. First of all, they're just darlings of the social scene and the Vanderbilts throw a party and that's where Fred Astaire meets a young woman called Phyllis who turns out to be his wife. Yes. Oh, she sounds so lovely. Very together. But in the early days, she would go and see him in shows. But then I think at one point she took like another date yeah, to the show. And stuff. He, he said he had two years of agony and jealousy. And it was eventually him saying he was going to Hollywood when she went, oh, no, I'm not having you hanging around all those starlets. We better get married. Right. <laughs> That's what did it. Right. But also at this time, Adele Astaire decides to retire. Mm. This is 19... She retires in 1932, so she's about 35. Yeah, she needs to retire to have kids. She's with Lord Charles Cavendish. They've courted. He's got a nice ancestral family home, Lismore Castle. In Ireland. So she's 35 and she gives it all up Mm -hmm. to go and be part of the English aristocracy. Yeah. Their dad died around this time and he says it was the first really bad news they'd ever had in their whole lives. Mm. Which is, oh, yeah, because that's how pleasant their lives are. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of nice. They just literally haven't had a bad thing yeah. happen to them, apart from getting tipped off a table in the middle of a show. Yeah, right, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so Adele is retired, which means now Fred is on his own. So he does the gay divorce, which tours. Cole Porter. Yeah, Cole Porter. Yeah, it's got Night and Day in it, the song, which became a massive hit. All these songs, he's the first one to sing them, and then they become huge hits that are covered by everybody for the Again, rest of all time. I didn't know Fred Astaire was a singer. He doesn't talk about it. He talks about dance, and it's like he also sings. He doesn't even really mention it. He doesn't think it's a big deal. He's Do just... you think it's like Nina Simone then, where in fact she just says she was a pianist. She had no intention of being a singer. Yeah, his... And then somebody said to her, if you want to play the piano, you sing as well or you get sacked. Yeah, so he's it... a dancer who has to sing. He has to sing because you just do in musicals. Yeah. Obviously in musicals you And he just happens to have a nice voice, but he's... Yeah, the fact he gets to premiere these songs. Yeah, right. It says, It was indeed my good fortune to introduce so many great songs by these top composers. Anyway, so he does the gay divorce. When it goes to London, it's renamed the gay divorce. Hey. But that had a very slow start, you know. People weren't so immediately receptive of Fred Stead dancing on his own. Because Fred yeah. and Adele were just so very yeah. much part of an act. They and missed oh, her. 
They missed yeah. her. It's yeah. it's like Andrew Ridgely going forward without George <laughs> Michael. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, when he starts in films and he gets coupled with Ginger Rogers, he's very wary of that. He loves being in films with her, but he's really afraid of getting coupled again. So he branches off to work with other people and then they come back together. He's really keen to establish himself solo. I love that on the opening night of the gay divorce, he gets a telegram from Adele and it just says, now, Minnie, don't forget to moan. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Always keeping him humble. (laughs) That's so funny. So 1933, he gets asked to be in a film called Flying Down to Rio. And when he gets there, they say, oh, can you do a little cameo as yourself in a film called Dancing Lady with Joan Crawford and Clark Gable? So he just comes on. As Fred does a little dance with them, goes off, it really introduces him to Hollywood, basically. Yeah, to the motion picture. Yeah, it gives him a really good start. And he says Joan Crawford was lovely yeah. to both of them and had them over for dinner a lot and stuff. Yeah. And then he does Flying Down to Rio, and that's a big hit straight away. And like you said, Ginger Rogers is already a film star at mm. this point. She's fourth on the bill yeah. above Fred Astaire. Yeah. So Flying Down to Rio... It's like the first time Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers dance together, which, of course, as we know, is the beginning of a beautiful relationship. And they end up making nine films mm. together. The second film is The Gay Divorcee. There they do Roberta with Jerome Kearns. Yeah, then Top Hat, cheek mm-hmm. to cheek in it. What I didn't realise as well, of course, because, you know, motion pictures were still in the early stage, well, past silent films and into talkies and musicals. But I didn't realise that Fred Astaire kind of innovated dance on screen because you had a lot of the Busby Berkeley musicals well, and stuff. The big chorus numbers and stuff. And what would happen, there would be a film, but the story would stop to have the music number. It was just this kind of spectacle thing mm. in the middle. Whereas Fred Astaire is introducing the song and dance number mm. as part of the story. And Ginger Rogers, particularly, they were both known that they could sell the mm. dances as the characters, to move the story on. He does talk about when you start dancing, you are essentially in a bit of a fantasy of it's beyond real life. They have to find a way of easing into the dance, so they'll start by saying, oh, hello, it's a nice day, isn't it? Well, do-do-do-do-do, little tap-tap-tap. Oh, yeah, it is. Oh, why don't you do it? You know, and it's the way of easing from reality to fantasy and then back into reality without disturbing the story. That's exactly what Fred and Adele used to do. In their vaudeville act, Mm. before they started the dancing, they'd have a little skit together. So that's interesting, Mm. actually, just making the connection now, that actually that's how he learned to do it. It's a bit like Charlie Chaplin. It's taking what you did on stage and bringing it into the films for the first time because films were still so new. Yeah, I thought of Charlie Chaplin a lot. At this point in this book, when he gets to Hollywood and starts making the films, I thought there's a lot of comparisons with Charlie Chaplin. It's a totally different act, but it's the same sort of thing. But I do think you can draw comparisons. I almost think there's a certain amount of clowning in Fred Astaire's dancing, There absolutely is. Yeah. Oh my God. Because it's, it's entertainment. Amazing. Yeah. And how much he had to do with the camera. They d- do rehearsals. He talks about you might have 18 numbers to do in any one film. It took seven to eight months to do a film because they'd have to get together, go through each number, invent the dances together, invent the storytelling, rehearse it to the point where they're absolutely flawless. And they pretty much filmed them in one take. When you watch these things, you're like, Jesus Christ, that's one take. This is this another is way that Fred Astaire changed cinema and is especially the way that dance is shown in cinema in that the camera could follow them yeah. in one take whereas before Busley Berkby there'd be lots of cuts and lots of close-ups and lots of side angles but actually when you watch Fred and Ginger you see the whole dance from one point of view so you're getting a dance that the dancer intends you to see as if you're in the theatre which is why it gets gets applause and things in the cinema because when you've actually watched that whole thing yes yes, you'd applaud it yes and you can see there's no trickery involved it's literally them dancing do you know what makes me so angry now I haven't watched them for ages but you know those shows America's Got Talent Britain's Got Mm. Talent which you can argue is a kind of modern day version of vaudeville right it's all these different variety acts the people who produce that and film that oh my god they have these amazing dancers come on these dance troops right and they're sat in a theater but we're seeing it on tv they do a cut every three or four seconds different angles 
judges faces and you're like no this dancing is amazing we need one shot from the front of the stage mm. that's how we're supposed to be watching this it actually would look so much yes, better yeah, you'd actually appreciate the whole thing <sighs> they yeah. need to watch more fred astaire films. yeah yeah because fred's dancing introduced that to yeah, the cinema yeah, yeah. just dancing in one take and, and also he said he never wanted to do the same thing twice so he'd always try and have new ideas. So let's try and dance like that, like the slidey thing. Yeah. And then one day he says, he's playing golf because he loves golf. And he says, I wonder if I could dance and play golf. So he has a little go, tap, 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 hits the ball. I think I can. So he suggests it to the film people and they say, yeah, that'd be great. So they actually filmed that on location. I've watched it. You can tell it's outside. And he's got all these balls lined up and he's going, dance, 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 whoo, dance, 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 whoo, dance, 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 whoo. ball after ball after ball. And they say, actually, could you aim the ball a bit lower because it's going out of shot? And he's like, as if I haven't got enough to do. <laughs> but when you actually watch it, you're like, bloody hell, he's actually whacking his balls to perfection whilst dancing. <laughs> it's insane. The skill of the man. And it was his idea. It's all the ideas he has. There's one where he dances with himself and they have to do split screens. I've watched that on YouTube as well. It's fantastic. Oh, my God, it's a whole world. He's left us with a world of dance you, you can watch any time. Do you know what? I would just urge anyone who isn't familiar with Fred Astaire or just knows his name. Obviously, we all know his name. Because of this book, his dancing is a complete revelation to me. So I would urge anyone, if you've not seen Fred Astaire dance, just get on YouTube yeah. and watch Fred and Ginger, oh, the way... Oh, Sid Charisse and him dancing. Oh, anybody. Yeah. And then there's... OK, so many things <laughs> happen. We, we, it's hard because we're going to run out of time and basically his life is amazing. And he's writing this in 1957 at the age of 58. He's got about 30 more years left in him. Tons more work. Oh, yeah. Yeah, he doesn't know that. Everyone's telling him he's too old. And they're going, how, how are you still dancing at this age? And he never stops. He has no idea that he's going to be in the towering inferno. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so Fred and Ginger are just biggest stars you could imagine yeah, yeah. at this point. And their films become, the musicals with Fred and Ginger become the biggest the box no office receipts one. for yeah. RKO. Yeah, yeah, they do. Swing Time with a fine romances in that. Follow the Fleet has got Let's Face the Music and Dance. Mm -hmm. Oh, oh my God. At some point, he says Holiday Inn with Bing Crosby. And that's where Bing premieres White Christmas. Yeah. What I didn't realise about until I read this book is that Bing Crosby sings White Christmas in quite a few films, <laughs> which then explains why it remains the biggest selling yeah. single of all time. <laughs> yeah, they just true. never stopped pimping yeah, it. Yeah. <laughs> They're probably like, oh God, here he goes again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And Holiday Inn has the Firecrackers dance, which he invented as well. And I watched that on YouTube. And he's going, dance, 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 throws these firecrackers. He's throwing them. And they really ping up on the screen because I guess the quality of filming, they really fire up. It's amazing. And the drunk dance where he said he thought it was probably best to drink what he did two shots of whiskey between each take and the seventh take was the best. Oh, really? He's a really good drunk dancer. <laughs> so skilled. So good. So Fred and Ginger did have a little break from each other so he could do few, the Bing like, Crosby films yeah. and stuff. Because I think they said like after like the sixth, seventh film, the box office did ebb a little yes, bit. Yes, and he was really keeping a sharp eye on that because he didn't want to let that happen to him. Yeah, he did a film with Rita Hayworth when he was 40 years old. There you go, knowing that Rita Hayworth's parents were vaudeville dancers and that she grew up through that and her first film roles were dancing with... I didn't know any of this. Yeah. I just thought she was some sexy screen siren like Marilyn Monroe. Her dancing's incredible. Yeah. Around this time, he says... Gosh, the older I get, the younger they get. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's life, isn't it? In yeah. Hollywood? Joan Leslie was 17 in The Sky's yeah. the Limit when he was 41. But yeah, and then anyway, we've got this whole bit now where it's the war and it's so interesting. Yeah. He volunteers to go to Europe, still in the war. They go to France, Holland and the border of Germany where... At night, there's air raids where the Germans are really trying to bomb this bridge in the town he's staying in. They keep missing it. He really wants to get out of there. They can't find a theatre to play in, so he finds an old theatre, knocks on the door, and the bloke answers. He says, can we put a show on tonight? And they fill the place, put the show on, but because of the blackouts, they can't get back to where they're staying because they can't see. So they all sleep on the stage. <laughs> and when I say all, here's oh, yeah. the list of the people who are on this tour... 
Jimmy Cagney, Lucille Ball, Greer Garson, Judy Garland, Betty Hutton, Harpo Marx, Dick Powell, Mickey Rooney. And I only wrote down the ones I know. Yeah, right. Yeah. And they were raising money for the bonds. Yeah, right? they raised bonds. millions. Yeah, they raised millions. And then, But they also entertained the troops. And yeah. He says it was just a riot of fun. One continuous riot. All the fun they must have had being together like that. Adele, at this point, during the war, she opened up Lismore Castle to convalesce yeah. all of the soldiers and stuff. I thought that was amazing. Yeah, it's amazing. And then also she went to London for a long time and was working in the hospitals, writing letters to everyone's loved ones. Yes. Personally writing thousands the sol- of letters. The injured soldiers who couldn't yeah. respond. Yeah, she'd do it all on their behalf. Fred said he always ran into people who said, I got a lovely letter from your sister. <sighs> yeah, it's amazing. And yeah. she was there throughout all of the air raids and bombings. Uh, the Blitz, she was there through the Blitz. She's brave to volunteer to go when lots of people were moving out. Yeah, it's pretty cool. And then he describes, right, it's really good in this book how he describes Europe when he says, you know, the hotel they used to stay in in Paris had like a truck up against it upside down and, mm. you know, it was all blown to bits all round it. It wasn't an uncommon sight to see a whole railway blown up and the trains upside down or it was a massive experience for him to go through all that and then he said I think they were in Belgium and this little boy runs up to him and goes I know you I know you do you yes you're you're Ginger Rogers (laughs) (laughs) just things like that because you start to realize how far you've actually reached through films yeah for sure anyway he did tons more films at 34 he retired because his mum said you should retire at 34 so he did to... Well, Adele did, more Yeah, or less. that's right. But what's really funny is he said, two years passed, Lionel Hampton crops up. Yes. And he said, I was listening to a Lionel Hampton song and it just blew my mind and it sent me. I just started to get a dance routine together and I was thinking, well, if I'm this into it, maybe I should be doing this for a living again. Two days later, he gets a call about Easter Parade. Because, because Gene Kelly... Broke his ankle or something. Yeah, Gene Kelly in broke rehearsals, his ankle. In rehearsals, they were already in rehearsals. So all the sets, costumes, everything's ready to go. They're just in rehearsals. But Fred Astaire is kind of friends with Gene Kelly. Yeah. And he's just like, am I treading on his toes here? As it were. No pun intended. Ouch. <laughs> so he, <laughs> so he him, calls yeah. him up and says, is this right? You're definitely out of Easter Parade. Yeah. He says, yes, mate, it's all yours. So yeah. he goes straight into rehearsals. Of course, they've got to do a couple of months. They've got to get all these numbers rehearsed. With Judy Garland, and it's the biggest hit so far, I think. It's a worldwide hit. Very legendary Easter parade, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, if anything is going to tempt you out of retirement, early retirement, it would be Easter parade with Judy Garland. But I just have a feeling that he was just hankering to come back He just decided it two days earlier. And by the way, in all of these breaks, he's really into horses. Horse, oh my God. There's a lot of talk about horses. (laughs) And he actually ends up investing in horses. Yeah, he does This is proper horse race. Yeah. yeah, what this one horse called Triplicate, Triplicate, which is obviously a bit of a legendary horse in its day, won him a quarter of a million. So it's paid for itself. He was quite successful. There's a lot of talk about horses in the middle. There's a of lot horse. of horse talk. I kind of glazed over, to when be he, honest. Yeah, when he has a break, it's horses or <laughs> golf. Yes, horses and golf. So he's never bored. So I'm really glad he went back. Yeah. To, <laughs> because because oh the rest God. of the book would have been boring if it was just about horses and golf. Yeah. So, yeah, Judy Garland used to spread a massive, massive hit. Yeah. It was started a chain of dance schools at this point. Oh, yeah. I googled those dance schools. <laughs> Did you want to go and take some classes? No, but there's 140 of them across America. Still? Yeah, still, wow. to this day. So it did become a really successful... He trained, personally trained, 150 dancers. He was hands-on with it. Feet on. Feet on! <laughs> A bit of hands as well, you know. Jazz hands. Yeah, yeah, that's a really cool side project. And it means that his name lives on forever, just in them. So then a film comes up called Barclays of Broadway. It's uh, Judy Garland again. Easter Parade is such a big hit. Now the pairing, the successful pairing is Judy and Fred. But as we know, Judy has a few problems. And she kind of bailed when the project is in its infancy. So Fred calls up Ginger and says, hey, Ginger. Yeah. And she says, yeah, I'm there. So Fred and Ginger are back together. Yeah. Winning combination. Yes. There's a few more. There's little, yeah. three little words. Oh, do you Let's know what? In, in the space where Fred and Ginger weren't 
together. Ginger went off and actually did some straight acting and won an Oscar. Yeah, I didn't right. know that. I didn't know that either. Yeah. By the way, that film Royal Wedding that we mentioned earlier with the mm-hmm. sliding dancing, 1950, his love interest was Sarah Churchill, the daughter of Winston, Winston. Churchill. I had no idea. Not a clue. Me I don't neither. really care. No, She's quite good in that film because I watched that. That film, Royal Wedding, was again supposed to be Judy Garland. Ah. So she's really mm. flagging at this yeah, point, she isn't, isn't she? she? Okay. In Royal Wedding is the legendary dance where the room spins round. Or, well, you're not supposed to know the room spins round. He's dancing. Spoiler alert. And, <laughs> and he dances up the wall, then he dances across the ceiling. Oh, like Lionel Richie. Dancing. Exactly. Lionel Richie, another person inspired by Fred. Dancing but, on the ceiling. Oh, my God, it's so brilliant. It's so brilliantly done. You can just Google... Fred Astaire, Royal Wedding, Upside Down, Ceiling Dance. It is phenomenally good. That is actually amazing. You're making me realise now then. Fred Astaire lives on through Michael Jackson, Lionel Richie, all these big 80s things. But also, when you think about it, maybe even bands in the 90s like Jamiroquai, who danced in those rooms at Tony. exactly. That's Fred Astaire. And he invented it. It was his idea. It was another one of his 4am ideas. Wow. On YouTube, there's a behind the scenes of that dance, right? But it's not really behind the scenes. All they've done is put where the camera would be and then revolved it so you can see how the room's revolving, so you can mm. actually see what he's doing in real time. It's just utterly brilliant. Yeah, but never mind how much his dance influenced every Broadway show that's ever happened since, or West End show. It came from musicals, went to film, and has gone right back to dance. His dance influence in yeah. dance is still right there to this day, 100%. So he's he's actually become... You know, Adele retires and then he makes this new partnership with Ginger Rogers, who are the biggest box office stars. But actually what he's also done at this point, he is a bona fide box office star all by himself. Mm -hmm. And actually the other leading ladies like Judy Garland, Rita Hayworth, Audrey Hepburn all want to dance with him. Yeah, Leslie Caron was dancing with him in Daddy Long Legs and they filmed Mm -hmm. it in Paris. And their big dance number at the end was outside and it had been raining forever so they couldn't film it. And finally it stopped raining. So then they ended up dancing in mud. And she says, I've waited all my life to dance with Fred Astaire and it's in mud. They're all just phenomenal films, though. And then Sid Charisse is back. And Silk Stockings, he says, when you've danced with Sid, you stay danced with. Now I get it from watching that smooth criminal style. Mm-hmm. That bloody hell. It's on fire. And yeah, what he really sees his future as is to get away from dancing a bit and do serious acting, do a bit more serious acting. Which he does in his later life. I I don't think he really got to do it at the height of his dancing fame. No. But as he gets older, he does take on a few straight acting roles. Yeah, And incidentally, he also does an NBC TV special, which he put on himself. And it brings the house down because I think it was really, really rehearsed and then it was one hour of live television, as television was live Mm -hmm. then in the 50s. Because it's live, you can see his skill because he's doing a whole dance. It's like people singing live. You suddenly realise, oh, they really can do this. Mm -hmm. And he got more acclaim and awards from that one TV special than anything else he'd ever done. But then the skill is there for all to see. I felt privileged just to watch him and Ginger dancing on YouTube. Mm. I can't imagine what it would ever have been like to have watched that in a live theatre. It would have blown you mm. away. Yeah. And then to watch it almost live as these films came out, to go and see them yeah. and to be part of the audience that applauds and stuff. We don't have an equivalent in modern day. We don't have any big movie stars who are actually primarily known for dance. Do we? Mm. Good point. I can't think of any. Because generally, if a musical comes... We still have musicals, but they just put the big stars, the yeah, actors in. Yeah, we still have them in the theatre, of course. Who? I mean, somebody like Charlie Stemp, have you even heard of him? No. He's a star of the West End at the moment. Right. He's done five years of being um, over the rooftop step in time in Mary Poppins. He was in Half a Sixpence, and now he's just gone into Crazy For You. He's a phenomenal dancer. Everyone's talking about him. You go and see him in the West End. Oh, okay, okay. And he's very good looking. He's a cheeky chap. That's the sort of thing where he may... If he went to Hollywood, maybe he's the next... But it doesn't happen. It hasn't happened yet, but it's people like that. So they exist, but they're still in the theatres. Or Matthew Bourne, Swan Lake. That's ballet, though, I've forgotten his name now. Yeah, it is, but they made a film of... Carlos thingy. See, I don't even know his there whole name. There are a few, but they don't 
No, nobody who's crossed over and no, become no, a big star because they don't make films like that anymore. In dance. Like no, if you think make... about the big film musicals, we say they don't. But then what's that one that won the Oscar? Chicago. With that Catherine... Moonlighting should have won it, but La La Land. The La La Land. I don't mean da- Moonlighting. I... <laughs> <laughs> I know what you mean. La La Land is a dance. Yeah, so I think there are. Yeah, more but they're of not. They that up. was Ryan Gosling and a generic American actress. What's her name? I don't know. I don't. I can't remember who's in it, but they're not dancers. They're... I want a dancer to be a big box yes, office star. Yes, that's right. That's, that's right. what I'm trying to say. Yeah. There isn't one. No. And it's weird because they were so phenomenally successful in the era of musicals. You know, these things work in cycles. I yeah. wonder if in it another 20 time. years we're going to get not just musicals back on the screen, but actually the people who can actually dance in those roles mm. to blow us away. Not just an actor who's had six weeks of dance training, mm. but an actual bona fide dancer who's been dancing since the age of an, four. An innovator of dance, yeah. the person that takes it. I think basically he pushed dance to so far to another level that it's really hard to top that. Even now, it's just physically phenomenal what he achieved. Well, you know what would happen, actually. They'd get Ryan Gosling to be in something and they'd CGI his body dancing. (laughs) But they would, though, wouldn't they? I don't know. I mean, uh, AI is just uh, going forwards leaps and bounds. You don't actually need to be able to dance. (laughs) Hey! (laughs) Anyway, near the end of this book, he says, everyone always asks him what he's doing with dance can he describe his motivation? Is he trying to do this? Is he trying to do that? And the very last bit of the book, he says, I just dance. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Thrift Shop Biography. We love making this podcast and we're absolutely thrilled that so many of you are already listening. Um, We're new to this and you could really help us out by leaving us a review somewhere, wherever you listen to this podcast. And if you could share us, tell your friends about us or drop some links on social media. We have a Facebook page called Thrift Shop Biography. So make sure you come over there to hear about the episodes first and what else we're up to. Okay, see you next week. And if you're new here, there are loads more episodes now to go and listen in the back catalogue. So make sure you go and enjoy them. Okay, thank you very much.